All right, everyone. Well, welcome back to Coffee Breath Conversations. I'm your host, Russell, and this is the 50th episode. And today I have my guest, John Euler. And John, I will give you a chance to do a brief introduction because you got a lot going on for yourself. Russell, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and congratulations on your 50th podcast. I also do podcasts, but not as regularly as you do. So, um, I am John Euler. I'm a licensed professional counselor. Has have been uh, working in the field of mental health for approximately uh, 30 years, a little over that now. And uh, three primary areas of specialization over that time: uh, survivors of sexual abuse, and actually significant sexual abuse, so much so that it shatters the the personality, as it were. So that's a strong area of mine. It's now called dissociative identity disorder, but uh, there's a theory of counseling that's come along. I'm very pleased to hear that it's come along. It's called IFS, Internal Family Systems Therapy. So I, um, I understand that very well. Kids in the system, especially um, junior high and, and teens, and ended up uh, starting my own 12-bed adolescent female group home, but worked while out in California, so I'm native from California, um, worked with all levels of continuum of care as far as kids that are in the system, especially out there, they call it severely emotionally disturbed kids. That actually gives background or uh, for me context to be able to speak to what I call the trans deception, because what we're hearing as far as the trans movement, everybody is now has heard of that, it is man-made. And so I, part of my work outside of my clinical work, I uh, do therapy full time uh, during, the, during the day, is I speak to issues of the culture and draw upon my background, both working with survivors, working with kids in the system, and then also working um, 11 years in the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections on psychology staff, was hired to start the first uh, nation's first, at least in the U.S., intensive treatment program in long-term solitary confinement. So I was the first one to do that. Uh, through that, accrued more clinical contact hours than any other prison psychology staff member uh, in the U.S. or Canada. So there's a claim to fame, huh? <laughs> so I had the Hannibal Lecters and other you know people that hack up bodies and all sorts of stuff. They were my clientele. Uh, I am also the reason why, because I had to blow the whistle on inmate abuse. So I'm the reason why, at least in the U.S., um, solitary confinement is no longer used on mental health inmates. So I had my own. If anybody's familiar with the movie Concussion and um, how if you go up against very powerful entities, it can, um, it can be challenging. So I experienced that. After 11 years, retired from the Department of Corrections, but while there, I uh, did a lot of sex offender treatment, headed up one of the, after the six solid years working in the unit, um, headed up one of, Pens one of Pennsylvania's uh, standalone high-intensity uh, sex offender treatment programs for sexually violent predators. That's a 65-bed unit. From there was um, trained, they flew Robert Hare out from British Columbia to train a handful of us in the PCLR, the Hair Psychopathy Checklist. So I am forensically certified in that. I did a lot of other groups, including also overseeing the mental health unit. Then after 11 years, figured it was time to retire. So I started uh, churchprotect.org and survivorsupport.net. Those are my two primary sites. Churchprotect.org is my training site. Uh, on matters related to uh, predators and psychopaths, which there are two kinds, there's white collar and bloody psychopaths. And then church, um, I'm sorry, survivor, uh, survivorsupport.net is my primary endeavor to try to help survivors of initially and primarily it was for sexual abuse, but it has expanded. And then I also have a live uh, Friday night my own program on TECN.TV. So I do that. That's called Journey to Healing. That's a neat break for me from tackling the social issues because I get to deal with counseling issues. So that comes on Friday nights. 
And um, then the rest of the time I find myself uh, compelled to speak to the issues that place women and children at, uh, at risk, including uh, the men that are trying to get into women's sports or that have gained access. It's not what people think. It's actually uh, for purposes, they don't care about the medals, by the way. So these are deviant men, and we can talk about what makes deviants, because that's really what we're talking about at the end of the day. My background enables me to do that. Plus, I am currently a uh, certified trauma specialist, and I run sex offender treatment groups. So I'm still in that. I've worked now with uh, sex offenders for about uh, almost 15 years, and I have a couple of uh, sex offender treatment groups that I currently run throughout the week. But also the other uh, issue uh, that's near and dear to my heart that I've been uh, creating a series on as far as podcasts is or videos uh, are um, how they are placing men in women's prisons. That should be a huge concern for all of us because the women are being placed in harm's way. But these are the same men. These are the same forces that are trying to uh, normalize sexual deviance. I should also mention that I, um, the majority of the group is out of Canada, but I am the lead clinical member for what's called the SOGI International Task Force. And I can give people that uh, website. Uh, if parents want to learn more about how the trans, what I call the trans deception, is sexualizing kids through schools and how to combat what's called SOGI sex ed, which is sexual orientation and gender identity, I recommend you go to our website, which is SOGI, S-O-G-I, one, two, three, in Canada, they have kind of these steps. So they say SOGI, one, two, three, taskforce.com. And you will find a tremendous, ever-growing repository of information to help parents be able to take back their schools and stop the sexual grooming that is going on because the trans deception is the world's greatest man-made, psych, uh, non-psychological, but it's a man-made psychological um, push to gain access to the most vulnerable of kids. The trans movement is a moving sidewalk. A kid can enter in at any point in time, but where that sidewalk dumps out, will be on a surgeon's gurney. The child will have already been sterilized and then they will be amputated. And after they have had, after the surgeon has gotten their money's worth, meaning made money off of the skin and sex organs of these kids, they will toss the kids to the curb and these kids will forever now as young adults be forever dependent upon pharmaceuticals. So Big Pharma is making a killing. This is a multi-trillion dollar industry worldwide. Jennifer Billick in her blog, the 11th hour blog follows the money. This is a massive attempt at making money off of kids. And then my concern in my area is that it is the ultimate end run on lowering the age of consent because it really is a significant push to legitimize and destigmatize and eventually legalize pedophilia. And because of my background, that is what I know and see with these different groups. They try to hide it, but I, I feel compelled to help people see that it really is not what it looks like. And every predator, every manipulator, every cult leader, every sociopath, psychopath, the one thing they go after are people's intuition, which dumbs down the reality testing. And that is what you have playing out on the social scene right now. Well, what do you have to say to people that say that, you know, anyone that says that there is some type of an agenda, that there's some type of uh, push toward for trans children and that, that it's hysterical, that it's based in transphobia, that it's homophobic, like what do you have to say when people claim those things? Because I've seen your, 
your work and I've seen what people say underneath and they're like, Oh, look, just another bigot, just another transphobe, just another person, you know, and then they, and then they try to deflect back. Well, you know, someone should, you know, look into this person because this person is talking about it so much. So why are they so hell bent on not having the conversation overall? That should concern us, Russell, right? If you have somebody who's not willing to discuss who's not willing to deal with facts, that should concern us, especially when it has to do with the health, safety, and welfare of women and children. There was a day and age where we raised the bar on protection of women and children. What's happened with the trans movement is this, and I, I have spoken a number of times about this a lot, actually. And here's what I want parents to understand about the trans movement is that it has been underway for approximately 20 years. So we have an entire generation of parents, an entire generation of kids that have become mentally and emotionally manipulated. We used to call it brainwashing. We've been mentally and emotionally manipulated to a point where we believe that this is something. It's legitimate. It's real when it's not. Now, how can I say that? Because I've been doing therapy with the exact population that is being targeted, quite frankly, with by the trans movement and by predators. So th those kids that are deeply wounded, as a matter of fact, those kids that make up the trans movement, right? That, uh, that the jackals are circling around and feeding off the carcass of these kids. I use that metaphorically, but you have special interests. As a matter of fact, I have a, uh, a, a video I put together called Understanding the Trans Movement. I recommend people go onto my YouTube uh, channel, which I think is John K. Euler LPC. Okay, and scroll down and look for um, Understanding the Trans Movement. Because in there, I, have, I, I bring to the audience a lot of good information as far as what are all the factors, but at the end I created a chart to show what are the special interests. So the first thing I want the public or parents to understand is this, that what seems like something that we should accept has been contrived, has been man-made. Okay, now, how can I say that? Because I can tell you before the year 2005, this did not exist. Now, people will quickly say, and this is the only thing the pushers of this agenda will say, is that, well, no, it existed. It just wasn't free to manifest itself. Really? Well, then uh, what we are being required to believe, quite frankly, drink the Kool-Aid, and that comes out of Jim Jones of Guyana, a cult, and the most time-tested of cult-like methods and techniques are utilized in this movement. Okay. If we are to believe that this was underground and suppressed, and finally now with education and enlightenment, out comes bursting forth this energy, this, this reality, like a volcano, because this thing has, if you look at the numbers of referrals to gender clinics, and I have a lot of those. I have a blog, as a matter of fact, in the very first blog. So I recommend, if you want to see stats, go to survivorsupport.us, survivorsupport.us, and you will see uh, by virtue of, uh, it's, it's on the top of the page because it's the most frequently accessed blog post. It um, is entitled, uh, what are the red flags that are being missed or something like that? But it has to do with what is it that we are missing or why, especially professionals, why are we missing very blatant red flags? Because there are nine key clinical indicators that are red flags of sexual abuse. And my, my concern and my contention is this, that the trans movement and its philosophy and its juggernaut-like um, uh, steamrolling effect. It has taken those that are mandated reporters by profession. There's a lot of different professions 
in which a professional is a mandated reporter to report suspected abuse. It is not our job to investigate. That's where law enforcement comes in. But there are many professions, education, so anybody involved in teaching is a mandated reporter. Anybody in the mental health field is a mandated reporter. Quite frankly, doctors, certainly doctors, are mandated reporters. Pastors and clergy are mandated reporters. Coaches, right? Anybody involved, uh, um, athletic uh, directors, scouts, okay? Anybody that deals significant uh, people at church, especially now youth uh, involved in youth and nursery. Okay, so w any so, of us that, yes. So basically anyone that's in a position of authority over youth. That's right, and have significant uh, contact with kids are mandated, they don't have a choice. Because if you don't report, then you are civilly or criminally liable. So you actually have to discharge your duty if you suspect, which means you have to notice. There are annual, if not biannual, meaning every other year, depending upon uh, what position professionally someone holds. But if you have any sort of licensure or certification, at least in the States, I'm going to assume it's the same thing in Canada, that in order to Requalify for your license, you have to have continuing education units. Mandated in the United States is child abuse reporting requirements. They've actually added one, which is very interesting under abuse, is ritualistic abuse. And that's a very real thing, and I deal with survivors of that. But the requirement is this we are mandated to report if we suspect. So the contention I have with the trans deception is this, that in order to buy into and in order to facilitate the transition of kids, you have to turn a blind eye to the nine primary red flag key clinical indicators that scream sexual abuse. You have to reframe those so no longer are you protecting children like you are mandated to. Now you turn a blind eye to that and you reframe it as gender. So depression, anxiety, panic attacks, eating disorders, self-injurious behavior, the personality disorders, um, any kind of significant mood disorders. You have to reframe each of those in terms of gender, and now you fast track these kids. Most of these kids that go on to have breasts removed, that go on to be um, have a complete euphorectomy, which is a hysterectomy, and having the uterus removed as well. Um, uh, for boys, complete castration. The vast majority of them have been influenced and come out of these pools of kids, so it's a combination. About 80 to 80, I assumed 80%, I saw a good uh, study done, it says 85%, especially these girls, are sexually abused. They have a past history of having sexual boundaries crossed. That means that their intuition has been dumbed down and now they are also traumatized. A traumatized young person, if the trauma happened early on, enough, two things will happen. One is they will start to what's called dissociate. They will, on some level, they'll say, this isn't happening to me, I'm out of here. Well, if they go away, what part of them comes forward? And some of the personalities, as it were, or parts, can be male presenting. So if a male part of them is out, as most sexual abuse survivors will conclude, especially when they're young, it must be because I'm this gender because the perp is abusing me and it's because I'm a girl. And here's one of the red flag indicators that every therapist used to know. This was, and this is an virtually an ironclad red flag. If you're a therapist and a young person comes in to you, and if what they say is, I hate, let's say it's a girl. I hate being a girl. I, I don't want to be a girl. I wish I was a boy. I simply ask this to those in the mental health field. What's the very first thing that should go through your mind? Well, it used to be 
that they were trained properly to look for and to discern what are the red flags of child abuse. Just as every rape victim feels dirty. Why? Because they've assumed the responsibility of the perpetrator and they want to come home and take a shower. And so medical personnel try to dissuade them from that. They want to, because lest any DNA get washed off. So there's two things that are very true about abuse survivors. One, they feel dirty and they feel they must have done something. One of the other profound effects, especially for younger kids, is in order to keep at bay the profound implications of the trauma, they will simply deflect by saying, if I wasn't a girl, he wouldn't be perpetrating upon me, so I don't want to be a girl, and I don't identify with being a girl. That's where you get some of the, the dissociative parts come in. So you have a young person, and one of the other signs is self-injurious behavior, the cutting. I have a lot of different pictures that are posted on the websites of these diabolic, diabolical Nazi-like greedy doctors where they show before and after. Oh, and like Dr. Gallagher, who is, I'd love to, anytime she wants to come on my program and debate, we'll be more than happy to because she's a mandated reporter. Okay, she has pictures standing next to young women that she has sliced off their breasts, I'm sorry, top surgery or what should be called double mastectomy because cults will reframe language. And you will look at the bodies of these young girls and they have self-injurious slicing marks all over their body. If I am a mandated reporter, I have been trained on what to look for for the red flags of abuse. And a doctor has to do a full physical exam. You mean to tell me that a doctor who's trained as a mandated reporter who sees self-injurious behavior is going to go ahead and slice off the breasts of a young woman instead of sending her for mental health treatment? That's sick. What, is, what has happened to our protective instincts for damaged and wounded young people? No. The trans movement comes along and says, let's fast track them. For what? For their good? Oh, and now after they come out of the cult-like state, they start to detransition. And what does the trans movement do? Oh, they pile on and they kick them to the curb, just like a cult does once a kid, uh, once a young person awakens to the fact that, wait a second, I think I've been used. And so they've been manipulated. So my greatest concern is, again, we're dumbing down mandated reporters' ability to meaningfully discern the red flags of abuse, uh, another part of the overall population are those young people that are on the autism spectrum. Why? Because they also have a difficult time with their intuition. What a perpetrator needs more than anything, since they have no conscience, the only thing left for them, uh, the only thing left to stop them from crossing the boundaries of their intended target is the other person. Well, you have one of two options then. If you're a perpetrator, I take a gun and I hold it to your head, so to speak. I, I'm i now going to coerce you or I'm going to manipulate you. If, I, if I'm going to coerce you, the, there's a strong likelihood I'm going to prison. Those are the kind of men I work with. That, but that's a small percentage. The vast majority of perpetrators are masters of impression management. That's part and parcel of being a psychopath and they know how to manipulate and con. And how you do that is you get the intended target of opportunity to dumb down their intuition. So, uh, abuse survivors and uh, kids, on, uh, young people on the autism spectrum have a very hard time with their intuition because it's already been crossed. That's all a perpetrator needs. And by the way, with the trans deception, it used to be that um, for those sm that small percentage that did feel like they were born in the wrong body, historically, it was less than 1%, let that sink in, and it was boys. And quite frankly, I'm convinced that in their background, you're almost always going to find sexual abuse.
And if I'm a researcher and I'm not asking for that question, I'm not asking that question, if I'm not looking for that information, I'll never derive that. Well, so John, yeah. you know, just to kind of bounce off a couple of things that you said there. So I'm going to tell a very, very personal antidote here. So my family, when I was a child, was groomed by a predator who gained access to my sibling and then repeatedly sexually assaulted my sibling over the course of, I think it was five years until they finally reported under basically telling my sibling that if they said anything, that they were going to, that they were going to kill my, kill us, kill the family and keep my sibling alive. And then my sibling would have to go live with the, with, w live with them. And that helped keep the abuse quiet for about five years. And then finally, um, finally my sibling, um, had a support that noticed something that no one else in the family noticed and kept bringing it forward, kept bringing it forward. And finally, but everything you've said, my sibling self-injurious behavior, um, frequent nightmares, um, bedwetting, all the signs and symptoms were there, but even then no one, everyone just thought my sibling was just acting out, was looking for attention was like, even then this is back in the early two thousands before there was, you know, the type of things that we're seeing now, uh, the boundary breaking sort of behaviors that we're seeing now. And still, even then people, you know, like, and, and I think for this, you know, this groomer, this predator that got access to our, our lives saw that our family was already dysfunctional, saw that break in the armor and used it to insert themselves into our lives. And then while the, he went to prison for, I think six years, which is actually a very long time for a sex offender to go to prison. Most of the time they don't go to prison that long in Canada. Um, and it was just, it was such a, it was, it was, uh, it was a very, um, it was very traumatic, I think, even for the people that had to listen to it. Um, so went to prison for six years. From what I understand, did not spend very much time in an actual prison because as most sex offenders, um, their, their victimology group is not inside the walls. Um, so was, and they often make model inmates because like you said, they're all about impression management, right? You you know, they, uh, they go in there. They're the ones that are very nice to the guards, very nice to their parole officers, agree to do all the, the stuff except for take programming. They often don't take programming and that I've done my own research on this. Got to minimum security, which is basically a day camp for perverts and, uh, ended up back in the community and he did overall six years. My family is doing life and that. I mean, I, I, you know, I would directly, you know, my family, you know, I love my family. I don't want to say ill of them, but we were never a close family after that. It destroyed our family. Our family to this day is very, very, um, dysfunctional still overall. And it all goes back to this one event. Well, series of events over, over time. Um, and it destroyed our family. I still think that I still think one of the reasons why, why my, my own mother passed away, um, is she just gave up on life. And, uh, she said, I, I couldn't protect my children, um, and just gave up on, on life. And that's one of the reasons why she, uh, why she passed away. And she would, I remember sitting at the dinner table, like, and at one point, this is how dysfunctional things had gotten. We were just eating supper. And my, my mom just looked up and said, I deserve the cancer I got because of what happened to so-and-so and then just went back. Everyone just went back to eating and I'm sitting there looking around, like, is anyone going to say anything? You know, looking at, you know, my dad's, my dad going to go, you know, to no, everyone just went back to eating. Like it was just normal thing to say at the supper table. So, you know, these, these predators and that we put so much focus on how we need to have more empathy for sex offenders and more empathy for victimizers. But I think as society, we should be looking to have more empathy for victims and empowering victims. hundred percent, Russell. So much has come to my mind. I'll just rattle off a few things. First, it's exactly what you said, that perpetrators and their 
uh, apologists, what I would say now, because there is a very significant push. There always has been, but this is much more creative. There's a very significant push in North America, but you know it's all throughout Western Europe. It's all throughout the world. There's a very significant push in the US and Canada to legalize pedophilia. People need to understand that once a man becomes deviant, and I will I'll describe that, I'm gonna write that down just so I don't forget because that's most important. Once somebody becomes deviant, they become a hunter. People need to understand that. They are now a psychopath. And a psychopath, there's three characteristics of a psychopath. There's two kinds, the bloody psychopath. That is what we all tended before I understood psychopathy. Okay. When you hear the term psychopath, what comes to mind? Well, you know, Freddy Krueger, Silence. Jeffrey the Dahmer, like, Area. yeah, the serial yeah. killers. And, and those are those are certainly psychopaths. But for every one of those, I'm convinced, and Robert Hare is what's <laughs> He has the a surname, the godfather of psychopathy, okay? He uh, created what's called the gold standard of forensic assessments called the hair psychopathy checklist. I'm certified in that. It's not bad, but I think there's a couple aspects of it that are a little bit that it needs some help, such as this. Oh, and I'm sorry. So Robert Hare coined a phrase called a white collar psychopath. So for every bloody psychopath, there are many white collar psychopaths. 